This is Book TV's Afterwards podcast. This week, historian Ruth ben Giat talks about strongmen. She examines how they rise, why they succeed, how they fall. She's interviewed by Barnard College and Columbia University professor Sherry Berman. Um, hi, Ruth. It's so nice to be here to discuss your interesting and timely new book, um, Strong Men. Um, so I thought I would start um, having read some of your previous work on um, Italian fascism, Italian culture, Italian colonialism, emigration, immigration, and other aspects of um, Italian political history. What prompted you to write a book um, that maybe starts with Mussolini, but um, as the subtitle says, goes all the way up to the present day? So a few things. Uh, first, I I want I thought it was a good time to look back at a hundred years of authoritarianism, and uh, not only because we uh, have such a flock of. Uh, illiberal rulers in power now. <clears throat> and especially, uh, I think a lot of people who work on this um, are trying to classify and figure out what is the nature of a liberal rule today. So, so that was one reason I wanted to uh, sort through this kind of history. And the book is a, is a history of the evolution of, his, uh, of authoritarian rule. The other, the other reasons are, that we're living in a time of intense historical revisionism of, of these past regimes uh, and in, in including to remove their violence. Um, so we have you know, Putin who um, erects statues to Stalin, but then sends historians and others who comment on the gulags into penal colonies. And you have Amazon that you know, uh, sells t-shirts that, that say Pinochet, did nothing wrong, referring to the dictator in Chile. And there's many, many other examples. And then the final reason is I wrote it as an American uh, watching Trump uh, come onto the scene and start holding rallies and loyalty oaths and institutionalized lying. And I wanted to document and figure out where this experience fits in history. So it's the first book to put Trump's presidency in the uh, context of 100 years of, of authoritarian rule. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. There's so much um, that we can dig into there. Before maybe getting into some of the sort of specifics of the book, um, you discuss sort of how strongmen come to power, how they rule, and how potentially they can be um, gotten rid of. Let me ask you first to step back a little bit then and talk about the title a little bit, right? Because you said that one of the reasons to write the book was to think about, you know, let's say contemporary strong men or authoritarianism in historical context. But strong men represents a particular category of authoritarian, right? So there's lots of authoritarian regimes that don't fall under the rubric of your book. So you don't deal with the Chinese Communist Party, for instance. Um, but so tell me a little bit or tell us, the folks who are listening, a little bit about why you focused on strong men as opposed to authoritarianism or dictatorships more generally. And what distinguishes them before we get into a little bit of the mechanics of how they rule and how they come to power and all that other important stuff. Mm -hmm. So I see, I see strong men rulers as a subset of authoritarians. And um, I, when I talk about the tools of rule, which we can get in later, virility and, or hypermasculinity is one of them. And so, so these, were, these are rulers who not only do the things that all authoritarians do, um, and in the 21st century, it doesn't mean they always destroy democracy, but they always damage it. But they also use their uh, male masculinity, a certain kind of masculinity, <clears throat> as a tool, um, as, a, as an, a component of their foreign relations, their, their relations with other male leaders, uh, and also the way they present themselves to their people. So, so that's, and they're also rulers who, uh, in political science, you talk about personalist rule. They're rulers who, even if they're in a junta, which is a collective uh, you know, military often, uh, dictatorship, like in South and Latin America, they have a very, uh, one man comes to kind of, uh, governance focuses around the needs and the desires and the power of one man. So it's, so 
governance is very personalized, foreign policy can become very personalized. And so this is part of this kind of alpha male uh, strongman profile. So the second part um, or the second word in your um, one word title, mm -hmm. so to speak, in your compound word title, men, that's important for you. It's not strong um, rulers. It's not personalistic rulers. It's strong men. So this is a subset not only in your mind of authoritarian regimes or dictatorial regimes, but there's something particular about the way these men ruled that would have differentiated them, let's say, from the way personalistic um, women would have ruled, dictators who are women would, would have ruled or might rule um, in the future. Yeah, and so I, I could have included um, people like Indira Gandhi or Margaret Thatcher, again, didn't wreck a democracy, but I wanted to isolate um, this, this kind of tool of rule of virility, which I rank alongside propaganda and corruption and violence and kind of the myth of national greatness. I wanted to take it seriously because I felt that it wasn't, um, that wasn't done in a lot of the uh, historical and especially political science literature. And I used extensively, including your own work. Um, and and you're, it's interesting to talk with you because you're very historically minded. Um, and I used a lot of political science uh, data sets and all this in the book. But I wanted to isolate this fact of hypermasculinity, which is used uh, in tandem with other tools. So for example, corruption, they become the man who gets away with things that ordinary men can't get away with. So it interlocks and it's, it seemed to me worthy of, um, of remarking upon given the uh, prominence it has in the profiles of many of the people uh, past and present. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let, we will get, let's get back to some of the differences perhaps between um, how political scientists and historians might look at this phenomenon. But I'd like to first get into some of the, the sort of analysis of the book so that the folks who are listening can kind of understand what you're trying to get at. So let's start with the first um, part of the strongman rule, which is to say how they come to power. So tell us something about what distinguishes the way in which strong men leaders come to power, um, you know, how does their rise differ from, let's say, the rise of other types of authoritarian regimes? What are the patterns that we can look for so that we know perhaps, you know, what's on the horizon? So we don't have to wait until, um, you know, we're already confronted with strong men. You can give us perhaps some things that we should look for so that we know kind of what's coming down the pike. So they, they often find an appeal and many of them, but not all come from outside the political system. Many are they're very skilled with media and self-presentation. Um, Mussolini was a journalist, Mobutu was a journalist. So these things I'm gonna talk about um, are valid what, however way they get to power. So, um, so one of the conditions that we see over and over again is that they appeal to people as a kind of alpha male, uh, rule breaker at times when there's been a lot of social progress. Uh, there's been gender emancipation, uh, workers' rights have bettered, uh, racial equity, and, and this, this overjoys some people and angers and makes anxious other people. And so these, these men come up as a kind of uh, check on this, although they also promise to kind of throw, throw everything up for grabs and they promise to approach politics in a new way. So that's, that's part of it. They, but one of the things that became very clear to me is that these, these tactics that they use, the lying and the, the violence, they use them on the way up. They test out these tools of rule as, they get, um, as they're trying to get into office. And so if we keep to 21st century rulers who have to get there through elections, um, one of the red flags is when they start talking about violence and they behave in different ways than ordinary political candidates. So when Duterte in the Philippines started saying, you know, you don't wanna vote for me because it's gonna be bloody if I win. Um, Bolsonaro who says, we're gonna have the biggest cleansing we've ever seen to Brazilians and knowing full well that there was the military dictatorship. Or Trump who, who said something inconceivable in the history of political candidates practically says, oh, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose any followers. So 
but these are these are testing the system to see what it's going to allow. Um, that's just one example, but there are many. So you think that um, sort of as with Hitler's famous Mein Kampf, to use perhaps the most extreme example, that we should take much more seriously than we perhaps do the utterances of people who at least initially seem to be outside of the kind of norm, who are pushing the boundaries of the political spectrum, that we shouldn't think of them perhaps merely as the kind of jokers or reality TV stars that um, they seem to be today, but that they're that they're doing this very purposefully to kind of test and see what the reactions of people and other elites are so that they can sort of hone their strategies to better be able to conquer political power. Yeah, that's very well put. They so so it's not that they're even though they do the same things over and over. There's no manual. Someone like Trump is not following a written manual of any sort. He doesn't even read. He just sees TV. All of them have this real sense of uh, they're opportunists and they're amoral, and so they will be whatever the culture needs them to be at that moment. And this is a very important point. They're shapeshifters. And they will ally with anyone, you know, and, and this is a, an interesting fact of 100 years of authoritarian rule. You get these very improbable alliances, right? So you have Mussolini started it out, you know, a total atheist, anti-clerical. No one was more anti-clerical than he was. And he's the one who ended up uh, allying quite early with the church, like in the 20s, you know, and, and, and the one who solved the church state separation issue and created Vatican, you know, independent Vatican state. The same you could say for Trump, of all the people to be embraced by uh, devout, uh, you know, Christians, evangelicals, and Orthodox Jews, it wouldn't be Trump, perhaps, who's a very, uh, a, not a pious individual, a, quite a profane individual. But because they they will be whatever need they need to be to get the the support from elites uh, and grassroots and they they kind of they're very good and this is where their media savvy comes in they scour the landscape and whatever the market will take uh whatever the market requires they can be that thing okay but one thing you do stress which um other analysts have stressed as well, which I thought you might talk about because it also has both historical and contemporary resonance, is that so many of these strong men come to power with the help um, or at least um, implicit acceptance of conservatives, even though in many ways they are not. So we see strong men correctly, um, you know, not just as a form of dictator, but also as generally, although not exclusively being on the right. But yet they're not often traditional conservatives, although they do often implement some conservative policies. But starting with Mussolini, obviously up through Hitler, and one could arguably make the case for the United States today, they've not been able to come to power on their own, but they have to, as you point out, build these kinds of alliances. They have to bring more people under their spell or umbrella. And particularly important oftentimes has been the willingness of conservatives to support them. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk about some of the sort of historical cases of that. You, you mentioned Mussolini with the church, but it's obviously, you know, there's a greater, there's a bigger story there. Um, and how, again, you know, some of the historical cases might inform not only how we interpret these alliances today, but what we might want to, you know, see is some warning signs. Um, you know, should we face a similar similar threats going forward? Yeah, that's. It's very. It's it, given how things turn out. It's very sad uh, this story because, uh, again and time and again, uh, conservative, their financial elites, business elites, industrial elites, other kinds of elites. Um, they bring in the extremist because most of these people have a criminal record. Uh, or, or some past of uh, extremism into the system. They mainstream them thinking they can use them. And I have quotes that are similar over a hundred years thinking that if we give him power and we normalize him in the system, he's gonna calm down. So I call that the pivot delusion, which is cause that's a word that was used a lot with Trump. Oh, he'll pivot, he'll become normal. Um, and of course that never happens. And what's so interesting is that this not only happens in positions like historically with uh, um, 
Mussolini and Hitler, who were brought in by elites, that's very well-known cases. But even when there's a coup, the case of Pinochet, so it was an American-backed coup, so he was there, but he, he needed still to do this work of um, winning over the elites to govern in a certain way. So the Christian Democrats um, uh, believed, many of them misread him, and this goes back to your other question about them being clowns and not taken seriously, misread him and thought that he would uh, restore order after the coup, because um, they'd gotten rid of Allende, the socialist president, and then he would restore democracy. So there was a former Christian Democrat uh, president, Eduardo Fray Montalva, who actually said uh, after the coup that in six months, you know, Pinochet's going to restore democracy. And this, of course, tragically wasn't true. And so when uh, Fray Montalva started speaking out later against Pinochet, Pinochet had him poisoned. And he went into the hospital and he never came out again. Um, so that's a very interesting pattern because it's regardless of how they come to power. So when we had Trump as a candidate, and I, I, it's like I couldn't believe my ears. Um, so he had just said the thing about shooting people in the end of January 2016. And then Jeff Sessions, uh, who was rewarded by this early act with the first attorney general, brought him into the system by hosting him at a rally and they need these establishment figures. So Trump actually said, I can't believe it, I'm becoming mainstream. <laughs> so, so these are these processes that recur over a hundred years and they always end badly. Uh, and often it's the first hour enablers, and there's plenty of them in my book, who uh, meet a bad end. So look what happened to Sessions, he eventually put a limit to uh, rule breaking and stood up for rule of law. And then he uh, was turned on and lost his Senate seat. Um, so, well, and as, and, yep. Yeah. And as many people have pointed out in the American context, the original members of the Republican establishment who were willing to accept Trump after his victory, many of them over the course of four years obviously got pushed aside. They weren't, they weren't killed as they had been in other strongmen rule regimes, but they ended up getting pushed aside. And at the end of the four years, the Republican Party was much more a Trump party than it was the Republican Party of previous nominees. So even if it's a watered down, less violent version, the same kind of thing happens, right? Which is these figures will, yeah. you know, uh, take advantage of the support or at least implicit backing of more traditional conservatives. And then they end up, you know, sort of pushing them aside when they're done with them. That's right. So that's the dynamic. And, and their basic philosophy of life, these men, is use and discard. The moment you cross them, because loyalty is everything to them, or they can't find a use for you anymore, they discard you. And here's where the outcome is different. You know, in Mobutu, in, the, uh, in Zaire, as he renamed the Congo, you would be put in prison or killed, or you'd have to flee into exile. And so one of the things that's been interesting is that the GOP has behaved the same way, even though the stakes are less than they used to be in dictatorships, right? What's gonna to happen to them? I guess what happened to, to, to Sessions, right? They, they lose their Senate seat, but they haven't had the spine to, to speak out. And now we're in a position where, you know, uh, illiberal leaders like Modi and Erdogan have called Biden to congratulate him uh, him, but uh, most of the GOP is still sticking to Trump and they haven't explicitly acknowledged that he lost. So, the, so and, and in this, we have to take Trump seriously. It's very tempting now, like in the beginning, he was a clown and now sometime, somehow that he's leaving, it's easy to think of him as some people are saying, well, he's not, he hasn't been that bad. And so somebody worse could come. But I would, I would caution against, uh, it's a, Psychologically, it's it's normal, and that's what often happens after re, after regimes too. Um, you want to forget and move on, but I think unless we come to terms with the the great effectiveness that he had in domesticating these elites, we won't be able to protect democracy in the future. Okay, okay great. Before we move on to the um, another really um, important part of your book, which is the tools of rule. I want to um, I want to ask you one of those um, pesky political science <laughs> questions. Um, so, if we're still on this kind of initial topic of sort of how strong men come to power, 
you know what your book stresses, and again, I think the title is indicative here because it's the focus is on strong men, is a lot of the kind of personal characteristics of these folks. You've just obviously talked a lot about that, the particular decisions they make, the things that they do and so on, and that they have a kind of warped sometimes version of charisma, right? They, they are, as you say, um, <clears throat> some of them had, you know, use the term spellbinding force, and you talk about their personalities um, sometimes in, in, um, in ways like to talk about their anger management issues, yeah. you know, to show that they have a certain, there's a certain type of person who ends up in the strongman category. But so political scientists, of course, we don't, we don't talk a lot about individuals. We think context is really what matters and that it's the sort of context within which um, particular individuals find themselves that sort of determine you know, whether or not they can succeed, what type of regime they will head up, that kind of thing. So, you know, obviously to just be kind of simplistic, you're not gonna get a Hitler or a Gaddafi in the United States, you could get a Trump, right? You're, you're gonna get a Hitler that could succeed in the 1930s, right? But he fails in the 1920s because obviously the situation in Germany is different in the 1930s than it is in the 1920s when he tries his beer hole putsch. Um, you know, you could get a Mussolini in the 1920s, but you're not going to. You get a Berlusconi in the, you know, in the late 20th century, right? They're not the same. But so, so let me ask you then. Your book focuses a lot on these personal characteristics, but there's also in the book a sort of sense of some of the contextual factors that you already mentioned, um, you know, cultural backlash and thing like that, that give strong men the ability to kind of use their, you know, sort of special talents and, you know, manipulative strategies to come to power. So maybe before we move on, do you want to say a few more words perhaps about what kind of contexts we might want to be particularly cautious um, about, the kinds of contexts that enable strong men to, um, to use their spellbinding power to begin to undermine or overthrow democracy? Yeah, well, so the re well, part of the reason I organized the book around the tools of rule so that, and each one goes over a hundred years, is exactly to show, so you, you kind of meet them as people when they're coming up in the early chapters, but it's not biographical. And although their personal characteristics are very present, my focus is on uh, the cultures of propaganda, the cultures of corruption. So one, one example of this is they all create these certain kinds of governing structures. Um, and uh, Jennifer Gandhi and other people call them inner sanctums. So this is used extensively in political science um, where they, they have these kind of, they create these worlds, these cocoons of uh, flatterers and sycophants and family members. So I have a paragraph about sons-in-law mm. who are complicit with them and who will treat them with kid gloves, thus allowing their personal quirks and uh, idiosyncrasies and things that prove very counterproductive to, uh, to run unchecked. And it leads to bad decision-making, which is, gets to it later. So, but all of them end up doing these certain things like divide and rule where they keep uh, so loyalty and not expertise or professionalism is the most uh, important characteristic to serve an authoritarian. So you, you get this kind of dynamics that are uh, not, uh, they're not, they're not, they're not, they don't produce good governance. They produce chaotic, inefficient governance. And this reflects their personality, but it also reflects the nature of this kind of elite uh, enabling that happens, and it happens around the world over and over again. That's what's very interesting. Okay, all right, so that's a great segue for us to talk about another really interesting um, part of your book, which is the tools of strong and rule, right? So these, these regimes are distinguished in a variety of ways, right? One is, you know, sort of how they come to power. A second, you argue, is the, the tools or the mechanisms that strong men use to maintain themselves in power, right? So you've already mentioned some of them and maybe you could talk a little bit more for um, the listeners about them. So you mentioned corruption, you mentioned virility, which I think is something um, pretty distinctive to this book. And also again, reflective of the, the title being strong men, you know, rather than, I don't know, dictators or, or some more gender neutral term. And you also have, you know, interesting discussions of things like, um, you know, propaganda, you mentioned violence, and also this idea of national greatness, which again, I think for American 
um, readers or rather listeners and hopefully readers um, will be something that they're probably pondering. So maybe you could go through for us a little bit some of the distinctive tools and explain their kind of logic and how they kind of work their magic, so to speak, to keep these um, to keep these guys um, in power. Yeah. So the key is that they're all interrelated. So the national greatness is very interesting because this and it interacts with the personality cult, with the idea that the leader is pure. Uh, so he's going to drain the swamps, which was a term that Mussolini uh, initiated, not Trump. Um, so and he really did drain swamps. That's the thing. But he meant it literally that yes. he drained swamps around yes. Rome and created these very modern new towns. But it also became a kind of theme or trope to to describe fascism's cleansing, uh, cleansing of corruption, cleansing of bourgeois, cleansing of eventually uh, cosmopolitan foreign influence, and so on. Um, but the, the national greatness is interesting because on the one hand, you have utopia. They all hold out. So the present is terrible uh, and the, the future will be better if we can only, uh, you know, have these national purification projects, which could be uh, in the sense, in the case of the fascists, eventually, you know, racial persecutions um, in the anti-colonial rulers. It's getting rid of foreign influence and foreigners who are kicked out. Everybody has their own. But it's also nostalgia for a kind of mythic better past. So it's not just making the nation great, it's making it great again. So Trump's slogan nearly gave the American, it was the American version of something that they all do. So Mussolini talked about being super modern and he built, you know, he also built highways and stadiums, everything modern, but he also looked back to the Roman empire. So up to uh, Erdogan, who's talking incessantly, he builds airports, he also builds highways, but he's talking about the Ottoman Empire. So they let people dream about uh, grandeur, a lost grandeur that only they, the leader, knows how to capture for their people. And that's, that's very uh, convincing and appealing to many people, especially who feel... Uh, and they feel that politics has passed them by or they feel dissatisfied. Um, and, and the maleness of this guide, that was the, the, the title that both Gaddafi and Mobutu had was guide. They are the only people who can see the future. And then the other part of this is the divine benediction. Uh, almost all of them are said to be put in office by God. And again, they, they alone, because of this, can see what's best for the nation. Uh, they can speak on your behalf. Trump said, I am your voice. So when that's where when Trump, you know, is anointed by evangelicals as the person who can bring uh, America, can save America. And the savior complex is a large part of that particular tool. So does this say something mm -hmm. then about the sort of, again, interaction between you know, what these strongmen do in the larger context, do we tend to see these kinds of folks coming at a time when there is a sense of national crisis, Italy after the First World War, Germany, obviously in Weimar, the Great Depression, um, you know, Pinochet, um, you know, the sense that, that, you know, Chile was going to fall to this horrible, you know, communist wave, and the United States facing not just sort of declining power internationally, but these kind of demographic shifts that perhaps made some, you know, white citizens feel like the country was changing in ways that were leaving them behind. So does this, you know, again, sort of feed off this kind of, you know, we should look for these kinds of rulers in these kinds of situations in these countries that are actually facing real problems that existing, you know, establishment figures, establishment parties are not addressing either directly or successfully? Yes, and, and the sense that politics is broken and they're gonna fix it. And then the, and this, and what I'm about to say gets into the propaganda tool, the sense that um, the media is, um, that so they have to be the victims. And another thing to watch for is if a politician on the one hand poses as very aggressive, talks about violence, uh, implicit, it could be rhetorical, whatever kind of violence, but at the same time as a victim, he's taking the hits on the behalf of the nation. So they don't just represent the nation, they embody the nation. And so this sense of victimhood is also very important. 
And they use this by saying that they, they enter the scene and they are going to tell the truth that the establishment media and politics don't want you to know. So I have a, a poster, I couldn't believe when I found it, uh, from, put out by the Nazi party in the 1920s of Hitler with his mouth taped up uh, because Weimar Democrats were preventing him, the truth teller, from getting the message out and how he was going to save Germany. Um, so this recurs, and this is a very big uh, theme with the populace, the far-right populace today, um, that, that, you know, there's the mainstream media, every country has its own name, and only they are in touch with the nation. So Matteo Salvini, who's a far-right politician in Italy, he, he said in a tweet, when they attack me, it's like attacking the whole nation. So, so that's another that's another thing, and it goes together with propaganda because they they have an alternate truth, right? It's fiction. They they kind of peddle this alternate uh, reality, and they have to do this very early on because, uh, as Trump started to by demonizing the press, because when they get into office, it's important that people already think the press is biased, so that if any of their secrets get out, because they're all very corrupt. If any wrongdoing comes out, people will not believe them. They will only believe the leader. So this victimhood is the, one of the first things they traffic in, and it's also one of the last things. And Trump is, is uh, kind of uh, using this full speed right now, and he will take his victimhood with him. It's part of the personality cult that they are victims. And so this this also gets to this, you know, sort of connection between the leader and the people he's ostensibly representing, right, which is one of the ways of creating that deep connection, a connection that can survive inefficiencies, that can survive lying, that can survive even policies that, um, you know, are sort of counterproductive or counter to the interests of his supporters is that they see this deep connection with him, right? He is not just their champion, but he is sort of embodying many of their frustrations and resentments. Um, and this gets to an interesting point that you have in the section on sort of propaganda. So you talk about, for instance, of course, um, rallies, right? And how mm. indicative rallies are, are of the type of, um, you know, um, the type of connection or the type of propaganda or the type of political activity that strong men engage in, right? And that's because obviously they have to have this direct connection with the population in a way that you might not find so viscerally in other types of authoritarian regimes. So you also have a great picture, which I had never seen, even though I've also studied the interwar period of wow. Hitler practicing for one of his rallies. Mm -hmm. I believe it was in front of a mirror, which is a kind of, you know, um, you know, not a picture that one normally sees. He, he looks more like an actor practicing for a role in a movie, which in many ways indeed he was. And we know that, you know, Trump's rallies were not just a significant part of his campaign, but by many political science accounts, actually extremely effective in mobilizing his supporters in ways that Democrats simply did not understand yeah. and simply did not match. And so I wondered again if you might have, you know, something to say before we move on, because we don't want to run out of time about, you know, again, this sort of how important this personal connection is both in both as a tool of rule and in explaining why people develop such strong attachments to rulers that for people outside of their sort of sphere of um, influence can often seem just bizarre and puzzling. Yeah, and that's a good way to put it because it is they they thrive on inclusion and creating a community of the included. And just to keep to Trump with a familiar example, it was very uh, and he's a marketer. So the red hats and the MAGA slogans and these rituals. So I have a whole I have a lot about the Hitler salute and how important rituals are to creating a community. And these are ancient things, and they soup them up and they mediatize them. But the other thing is that all successful uh, strongmen have known how to create a direct communications channel with the people. And that is true of Mussolini and his newsreels and his rallies. And they know how to perform. Uh, they know how to m mirror back what they think the crowd needs them to be. I keep saying that because it's really important. Up to 
uh, Modi in India who uses Instagram in a very, very effective way. But what's interesting is the, the mechanisms haven't really changed. You have to have a personal, uh, direct, unmediated connection with the people. Uh, you may use Twitter today or Instagram versus Hitler had the radio. And it's very interesting. This isn't actually in the book, but um, I do talk a lot about Hitler's voice and the effect of his voice. But um, there's newer research now uh, just came out since I published the book about the type of uh, microphones that Hitler was using because Goebbels was very, very state of the art. Uh, he looked at American advertising, anything state of the art that could help the performance of Hitler, he would do. And and this, this part is in the book where he realized really early on that Hitler couldn't speak in the studio. He was boring. When he, when he talked in a studio, he was totally wooden. He needed the crowd. He fed off the energies of the crowd. But now what's come out is that the type of microphones he got for Hitler to use were much better in terms of amplifying sound. So Hitler also heard his own voice um, at, amplified. And so that also... It, these people feed off the energy of the crowd. They, they, live, they need the crowd more than the crowd needs them, I say in the book. And it's because of their ego and because they know how effective it is to replenish the bond because personality cults need, they're like plants, you have to water them. <laughs> and you water them with the energy of the crowd. Um, and this is why Trump does these ridiculous things where when he came out of the hospital, he did that drive by, which endangered all of the Secret Service people because he had COVID, but he still needed to drive, do a drive by and see the cheering crowds. And, and he was roundly blasted for that. But their ego needs and their marketing needs are such that they realize if they vanish from the scene and they're not in contact with the people, they, it can wither. Well, so actually this brings up another tool that you stress in the book that you've, you've mentioned in passing here, which is this, um, this idea of virility, right? So you also, you have in the book uh, a number of very um, evocative pictures. So we're all these days familiar with, you know, pictures of Putin bareback on the horse yeah. or fishing, showing off his, you know, um, his pecs and all those kinds of things. You have a great picture of Mussolini, a very similar, you know, shirtless threshing wheat. Um, and, you know, the thing with Trump is part of what you were talking about, right, was a desire to show I'm not defeated by this disease. I don't wear a mask because that's unmanly somehow or another. I don't understand. But, you know, that this is actually, it's not just a personal thing. Um, it's part of Again, the tools of rule, as you say, the ways in which they're sort of cementing their connection. And so, so again, since I think that that's probably something that I know certainly political scientists don't think about, um, you might want to talk a little bit, um, just give us a, a few more sort of examples so that we can understand how virility kind of can work as a tool of rule or has worked as a tool of rule historically. Yeah, so most obviously it's the sphere you're, you're talking about where they use their bodies very carefully uh, as, dis, as a form of display. Um, not all of them are stripping their shirts off, but all of them know to be what the nation needs them to be. So some of them, so there's kind of a theatrical strongman like Gaddafi with his clothes, and he often wore uh, clothes that had pictures of other men he was honoring. And he, he, the longer he stayed in power, which was like 42 years, let's imagine 42 years under Gaddafi, the more theatrical he became. Others are more statuesque, and that's especially like the military dictators. Or think of Stalin, who's not in the book except if he influenced people, but he had a gravitas, right? He's not a theatrical but they all know that they become these anchors for the population. And that's also why when they leave, they have a sentence that you don't get rid of them very easily. And also they stay within the culture. Um, so virility is that, but virility is also very connected to corruption because they become the man who gets away with what other men are too weak to get away with, right? They, are, they often have supernatural qualities, let's say. They're divinely ordained. It connects to the, what we talked about before with the national greatness. And, and one dynamic is that they're seen as very pure and everyone else is seen as corrupt around them. So they're very good at uh, having a culture where they stand above everyone else. 
Um, and then, of course, as if, in terms of violence, they become the models or the instigators of violence, right? They are the, 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 they are the manly man who knows how to, to kill, right? Or knows how to be a brute. You take what you want. So Trump's, uh, Trump's you know, thing, uh, when he talked about uh, when you're a star, they let you do it. You don't even have to ask. That came back. He said it in 2005, and it came back to haunt him in 2016. A lot of people were mystified why it didn't end his, you know, why he got elected even after that came out, because that is an appeal for many people. Uh, when you're a star, you don't have to ask. Uh, and that, so they managed to channel aspirations of men and women. Uh, and, and this is where this kind of glamour, the glamour of lawlessness comes in. And all of this is tied to virility. Um, so I really, I felt that that was what was missing in a lot of accounts um, of authoritarianism. And so I wanted to take it seriously. Is this in some ways then a sort of personal version of that national greatness striving that you mentioned earlier, which is to say like, again, he, the strong man, embodies the kind of pushback against weakness, against decline and decay um, in his own self, um, that he's trying, or he's he's claiming to his supporters that he's trying to sort of recreate for his people or his nation more generally. So there's a there's a kind of connection there. Is is that is that what you're sort of found? Yes, they embody the nation in that way. And so Trump's about with COVID, the whole way the COVID thing was managed, how he and this didn't this was after the book was published, but I did an essay in the New Yorker that draws on things I started to look at in the book how he, he can defeat illnesses that lesser men can't. Um, and when, when he came out of the hospital and he did this political theater where he went up the stairs, which was hard for him because he'd just come out of the hospital. And then he stood there not saying anything surrounded by flags. Mm. And so it was a balcony. So everybody was making these comparisons to Mussolini. But what I was struck with is that he, he knew that his followers needed to see him um, as their rock. So he just stood there and let them, let himself be looked at. And the cameras flashed and he didn't say anything. And then he went inside and of course he, let, he released a video. But knowing that the supporters need to see that he's okay is part of this psychological cunning that these leaders have. Um, and of course it translates into political theater but that again, sometimes is not taken seriously enough. The staging of politics, the theater of politics. Right, and so that resonates with some of your earlier work on culture, right? Which is yeah. that perhaps a lot of folks who are, you know, sort of see themselves as kind of rational and enlightened don't fully recognize the importance of emotion in politics, of, of the irrational, of the theater aspects of it. And so we laugh at these things and we don't understand their attractiveness and power, but in fact, for many people, and it's not a question of intelligence or lack thereof, it's just a question of different styles. We, we don't see these the importance or the power of these things until, until it's, it's sort of too late. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. And so, and then people often say, well, democratic you know, politicians also have cults of personality, look at JFK, et cetera. But what I'm interested in is this very dangerous melding of what we've described, the alpha male, the male who knows how to communicate, who has glamor with lawlessness and how lawlessness is part of their charm. So in the book, and this gets into also both the corruption and the violence chapter, rule breaking, which from the very start, they come up as rule breakers. They're gonna, they're gonna upend traditional politics. They're providing, they communicate in new ways. They rejigger everything. They're, they're, like, they're like volcanoes that erupt. And when they leave, the political landscape isn't quite the same. And even in our country, which is unusual, we have these two massive parties, right? Other countries have more parties. Look what's happened to the GOP, where you had the never Trumpers who exited. You know, they don't leave things the same as when they came in. Okay, so before we actually get to that, let's just um, let's talk about, um, so to speak, the third 
part of your analysis, which is um, how Strongman rule ends, right? So you mentioned already, and you mentioned in the book, something also, again, that a lot of other analysts have noted, right? So you say they never leave voluntarily. Strong men will do anything to stay in office, even starting wars or deepening involvement in doomed <laughs> conflicts. Um, and again, that is something that, you know, the, the folks that my, my political science colleagues who like to count things and analyze things have also found it's very hard to get, you know, authoritarians, populists, strong men, I guess, um, more specifically to kind of leave office. And so I want to, if we have a moment, we might discuss Trump in this regard, because obviously it's very unusual for them even to be defeated in elections, um, much less leave. But I wondered if you could tell us a little bit then about, you know, based on your historical analysis, some of the ways of resistance to strongman rule. And you mentioned both um, resistance on a private level, what the Germans would sometimes refer to as an internal exile. Mm -hmm. But also you mentioned some very interesting resistance movements and the and the, the types of resistance that has been most successful over time. So maybe you could tell us again a little bit about how Strongman Rule ends. And for those who are interested in learning lessons from your book, you know, what kinds of resistance um, are most efficacious in, you know, bringing these kinds of, taking these kinds of leaders out of power, rebuilding um, regimes, um, you know, after they've been trampled by these types of dictators? So most, the, the most, uh, the most manifest uh, and obvious way is uh, mass nonviolent protest, which there's uh, lots of really good studies on that. And the, the point of that is, is threefold. Number one, it sends a message to the ruler and it can be effective if the regime is already tottering. But two, it sends a message to the elites, to the enablers, that it's time perhaps to think about the phenomenon in political science of elite defection. Um, and that's been very interesting, of course, to watch now and like how few have defected, uh, which is pretty, pretty incredible among the GOP. But it also sends a message to other people who have been afraid to come out uh, and protest. And, and here I'm, I'm basing on classic dictatorships, right? Not, not the, not, or even in Putin's Russia. It, numbers build uh, momentum and more and more people feel emboldened when they see many people in the street. And it's harder for the, the forces of order, law enforcement to, uh, prevail when there's, you know, when it becomes truly a mass movement. So that's one way. But there are times where you can't do that under, you know, uh, when dictatorships are at their peak. So I talk about other forms of resistance that have recurred from uh, reclaiming the public sphere because authoritarians colonize the public sphere. You know, they, they send people out marching, they have rallies, um, public space is full of their portraits, like, you know, Gaddafi, giant portraits of them, Mussolini. But uh, leaving, gr doing graffiti or leaving leaflets like the White Rose uh, college students did in, in Germany, or um, using the body to speak back to, um, to the ruler's colonization of the body. And this, in Putin's Russia, there's a lot of interesting resistance involving uh, people intervening on their bodies, like uh, sewing their mouths shut to protest being uh, in a penal colony, or or there's a history of self-immolation, and that's what started Arab Spring, also. So, and also not doing things, and so some of things, some resistance is very private. But when you have an entrenched dictator, it's very, it can be very moving to keep hidden uh, a photograph of someone you know was murdered by the dictatorship. And I think one thing I found especially touching was how certain um, techniques have recurred, uh, such as uh, human chains. Um, when communism was falling, there was this Baltic way where there were human chains of people holding hands across borders. And then I found that again in resistance to Berlusconi, uh, who was really you know, uh, threatening democracy by personalizing the law, et cetera, cracking down on media. Um, and they would hold hands and encircle endangered buildings like the Ministry of Justice. And this was cited by Hong Kong protesters in 2019. So just as the, this kind of playbook 
um, recurs among leaders where they strip their shirts off and this talk about throwing people out of helicopters. So does resistance to them. So there's that history that I wanted to include and honor. So one of your, one of your sort of positive lessons is that folks engaged in resistance have to recognize that while their long-term goal is obviously getting rid of strongmen or dictators more generally, what they're engaged in, at least in the short term, is, is kind of a signaling exercise, right? Which yes. is you're, you're signaling to your fellow citizens, you're not alone, um, that you know, we have some solidarity and that we can you know, act together despite this repression to express you know, our desire for freedom, our desire for democracy. And so that you should, you know, as a resistance, as a resistance actor, you need to focus not just on the long term, but on the sort of short term step by step goals that are required to, um, you know, to eventually, you know, perhaps hopefully reach your common, you know, the common goal or the desired endpoint of getting rid of this type of dictatorship. Yeah, because just as um, these states build slowly and ex except in a case of a coup, um, and when people say, you know, they'll say to me, especially like 2017, 18, well, what are you talking about Trump being authoritarian? You know, it's not like Putin's Russia, you know, you wouldn't be able to speak, et cetera. But Putin started somewhere. All of them started somewhere and this evolved. By the same token, resistance has to start somewhere and build momentum until conditions are right for it to become, uh, perhaps have a different meaning. Um, but without those signals uh, that affirm the, the kind of horizontal bonds of civil society, which is the thing that authoritarians most fear, and also show that not everybody is conforming. And I interviewed people who uh, were in Libya and in Chile, and they said it's very important to show that not everybody is conforming. Um, and I was inspired by someone I knew who wasn't conforming. So this kind of transversal horizontal communication that might not be seen by many people, but it leaves, it's a moral example as well as a practical example. It's very important, even if the end uh, result is not yet in sight. So I know that unfortunately we are nearing the end of our um, conversation. So I thought what would be really helpful for um, listeners and hopefully again readers is for you maybe just to use the last few minutes to talk about you know, as you've already mentioned, some lessons, right? So the point of doing a historical analysis is, is that we can learn from, you know, what's happened in the past, what's worked and what hasn't, what signals we should pay attention to, you know, what things we don't fully appreciate, but now with the benefit of hindsight, perhaps we can. So maybe for the last few moments, you might tell us, okay, look, if there are some takeaways from this book for folks who are interested in protecting democracy from this type of rule? What are the, you know, the parting words you might give? Well, one is, is uh, you know, that when we, t we tend to be optimists and not to want to recognize what's in front of us. And so a lot of these things can be avoided if these extremists are not led into the system in the first place. And if people recognize them for what they are and not dismiss them as clowns or that they must be just kidding. So take people for what they are. The other is to um, time after time and culture after culture has had to confront some of its cherished myths. Oh, it can't happen here because we are a bastion of democracy and the Chileans said this and Americans. Um, and, and recognizing uh, authoritarian threats means throwing these things away and, and taking a very hard look at what in your culture has allowed this to happen after the fact. The other thing is that democracy is an honor system to some extent, and we're dealing with people who break the system. They're not men of honor. And, and it's important to have uh, in their wake a, a very vigorous response to correcting all of the loopholes and weaknesses and in institutions that they exposed. So one of the mistakes that the center left made in Italy, so. Berlusconi was voted out after five years of government and incredible corruption, changing the laws to suit his private, you know, judicial problems. And he was voted out in 2006. And there was expectation that the center left would um, address the, you know, pass laws to 
increase accountability and anti-corruption, but they wanted to turn the page. They felt relieved <laughs> and they didn't do that. And so there was rising popular anger and he was, and so Berlusconi came back in in 2011 and he was more corrupt than ever um, and, and kind of souped up everything he was doing because he could. So we right now in America need to really have a very hard look at all of the things that allowed Trump to do what he did um, and reconsider. Um, and that might be hard because half the country, meaning the political leadership is still anchored to Trump, but that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't try. So, so learning the lessons of history is really the key lesson, so to speak, of your book. Yeah, that, that, you know, it's not just because there are these patterns, this is the key that because things recur in different circumstances and each each ruler has uh, an ability to do damage in his own way. So, hit, so Trump isn't Hitler. We're not having another Holocaust right now. But Trump has done a new, an immeasurable damage that I think we haven't even begun to assess. So history and looking at these patterns in history and these kind of it is, is a lesson to what to avoid in the future and also knowing what to look for. There are warning signs, and other books have done this, How Democracies Die, and your own work, too, uh, historically-minded work. But I think um, also looking at other forms that abuses of power can take, and including uh, the, the gender, uh, the, gen the appeal of the kind of the attachment to an old model of kind of male forcefulness as equaling power has also gotten us into trouble. And I think it's time for something new. So I, I'd like to, um, before I, I thank you for this great conversation and the opportunity to read your book, I, I wanted to end with um, something that you say towards the end of the book. And you say, in fact, strong men do not vanish with their exits from power, but instead remain as traces within the body of their people. The muscle memory to salute and sing the songs can be hard to shake. So. You know, once we've had a strong man scare or a brush with authoritarianism, it's imperative for us as citizens to learn from those lessons and to correct those injuries or weaknesses so that we don't perhaps fall prey as easily um, in the future. Because, um, you know, just because Donald Trump lost the 2020 election, so to speak, doesn't mean that the kind of threat that he represents um, can just be you know, it's just going to disappear um, when Joe Biden takes the oath of office in January. Yeah. And I think many people have learned not only in the States, but abroad watching us that we can't take democracy for granted. We can't take our rights for granted and we can't assume someone's going to do the right thing. This, this is a kind of a human capacity for deludedness where we assume that the person will do the right thing in time. Uh, and, and that isn't the case. Well, thank you very much, Ruth, um, again, for the opportunity to talk to you about this book and this super important and timely topic. Um, hopefully lots of people will um, buy it, read it and, um, and learn from it. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. Subscribe, rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org.